So as we continue to worship you, Lord, just move in power in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Jesus Christ promised he was going to return. When he left from the Mount of Olives, the followers stood there gazing into the sky. The messenger said, why do you gaze? This same Jesus who's been taken up from you will return again. And he sent them into the world. This morning, you and I are going to look into God's Word together in the next few moments. And how is it that we live in expectation in these last days of the Lord's return? Sometimes I fear that we have lost the expectation of the imminent return of our Lord. Listen to me. This old preacher knows of nothing in the Word of God that has to take place before the Lord returns for His church in what we call the rapture. That rapture simply means snatching forth. That's when two are in the fields plowing and one is taken and one's left behind. Two are in bed, one is taken, one's left behind. The difference is one knows Jesus. The other one has yet to come to Christ and is left behind. I pray that no one in this room and no one watching through stream this morning would be left behind. Because you see, I know of nothing that would hinder the Lord's return now. Before I finish this message, and some of you say, oh Lord, please. But the grace of God gives more opportunity for His church to continue its work and for people to come into that relationship and that knowledge as his church shares the good news. This morning I'm going to ask you to get your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, the third chapter. I'm going to begin in the first verse in just a moment. And I'm going to ask you to leave God's Word open because you see, that early church lived in such expectation that they would greet one another with the words, Maranatha. Maranatha. When they said goodbye, they'd say, Maranatha, which means even so, come Lord Jesus. They were so expectant. And you know what I said in the first service this morning, when I'm expecting someone to show up at my house, things are a little different at my house. My wife tells me I can't throw stuff around on the floor, so-and-so's coming. Clean up, so-and-so's coming. Well, this morning, can I tell you, clean up. Jesus is coming. Get ready. Get right for the flight. I love church signs. Have you ever noticed some churches try to put all their theology on the sign? <laughs> My favorite church sign was the Rapture Preparation Center. Get right for the flight. And they had in their church, and we're not going to do it, what they call rapture practice. And everybody, one, two, three. Well, I want you to know, you don't have to practice the rapture, you just got to be ready for it. He'll take care of getting you. You mean, John, you really believe that? Yes, I believe it with all my heart. I want you to know, I believe in the second coming because I experienced the first. There's actually more Scripture about the second coming of Christ than there is the first coming of Christ. And that's how the scribes and Pharisees, the professors and theologues of their day missed it because they were expecting the setting up of the kingdom and everything at the beginning. You see, the next thing that happens is the rapture of the church. He comes and He takes the church out of here. He comes as a thief in the night when no one's expecting him and you only know that he's been by what's missing. And then there's that time of false peace and a time of great tribulation and then he comes and we get to come with him. You know I took my wife on our first trip to Israel and we were standing on Mount Megiddo and we were looking over the valley of Armageddon 
And on the other side of that valley is Mount Carmel. And we were standing there, and I said, baby, I don't know. Baby, that's what I call her when, I, when I'm sweet. And uh, <laughs> baby, I don't know if I'm going to bring you back here to Israel. I don't know if we'll get to do that. But one of these days we're coming back. But we're not coming by, back to fight a battle. We're coming back to watch Jesus fight the battle. And we're cheering him on, go get him, Jesus. Go, Jesus. Because you see, when we are raptured out of here, we go to the Bema Seat. Now, the Bema Seat, only Christians, it's not to see whether you're saved or lost. It's where the rewards, it's where our crowns go. It's where we've laid up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And the treasures aren't for us to go kicking down the street saying, look at me, I've got these crowns. How many crowns do you get? It's all to put at the feet of Jesus and say, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. And the Word says, and for a long time, I, it says, He'll wipe every tear from our eye. Well, you know, why do we have tears in our eyes? We're coming from the Bema. We're going to see missed opportunities. We're going to see things we should have done. We're going to see things that happen. Not only do we get rewards for what happened, but we see that stuff, that sweet, strong stubble that burns, and it's gone. But then I pray to God. He wipes those tears, and He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and inherit that prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Whew. And then we go to supper. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Two varsity dogs and order rings, a big orange, and Krispy Kreme donuts for dessert. <laughs> you have what you want, I'll have what I want. And then when Jesus stands up at the dinner table, He's coming to establish His kingdom. And that's kind of where we are in these, if these are the last days. Now, can I feel at home? Yes. This means yes, this means no. <laughs> Those of you said no, I'm going to anyway. Uh, not too long ago, I was preaching in an interactive congregation. They participated a little bit. When I'd say something and they'd like it, scared me to start with, they'd go, uh-huh. <laughs> First time I kind of stuttered through. But I got into it and it sounded good that that, uh-huh. Well, this morning, as I read this passage, and I, held, I hold God's Word in high honor, so I, this is not to make fun at all. This is for affirmation as much as anything in knowledge. If I read anything in this next few moments from God's Word that sounds like it describes the culture in which you and I are living in, would you punctuate it just by saying, good, y'all are great. Y'all got it already. Y'all been there before? Uh-huh. Okay. Second Timothy, the third chapter, beginning in the first verse. But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents. Moms and dads, can I get an amen? amen. Ungrateful, unholy, unloving. Irreconcilable, malicious gossips, malicious gossips, malicious gossips. Come on, Baptist. I know we don't gossip, do we? We just share. I want to share something with you. Brrr. Stop it. Paul had no idea that the Holy Spirit that inspired him to write those words, that 2,000 years later there would be an entire industry developed around gossip. Check out at any local grocery store and as you're waiting, six foot behind the person in front of you. Look at the magazines. 
that are gossip magazines, sharing with you stuff you shouldn't know and have no business knowing anything about in other people's lives. And then you turn on that television, or should I now be more contemporary and say you turn on your monitor, and you see show after show after show that sharing gossip about other people's lives in public. Gossip destroys lives. I don't know what idiot said, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Words destroy. Words minimize life. Words in careers. Words in marriages. Words break relationships with family and children, friends, communities. Words in America have us more divided as a nation as any time before until the Civil War days. Malicious gossips. Without self-control. Brutal haters of good. Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its powers, and avoid such men as these. Living in the last days, how is it, if this describes our time, and if these are those last days, how do we live? The first thing is, he says, avoid the pleasure seekers. And everybody says, amen, amen. I tell my kids, don't run around with those guys. Don't run around with those folks. That's the wrong crowd. You don't need to run around. Now, I can sh that's not what this passage means at all. However, I can show you Scripture that will substantiate that, that corrupt com company, keeping corrupt company breeds corruption. However, what Paul is telling Timothy and us in this passage is those holding to a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. They're not holding to a form of godliness. We are. Holding to a form of godliness, but it's an empty form. There's no reality there. Because there's an absence of power. We can do what we can do, and we get what we can get in our own strength. But I want you to understand this morning, folks, that's not enough. What we can do is not enough. What happens with our strength, what we can produce through our promotion, through our organization, through our work, is not enough for the world in which we live to come to know Jesus Christ. We must function not in our strength, but in His power. And after you have received the Holy Spirit, the Word says, you will receive power. And you will be. It's a natural outflow. It's a natural outflow. Have you all seen these things where they're putting this candy, this whatever stuff it is in coca Colas, and it makes the whole thing to blow up and spew, and you put a top on it? You put that much power in a bottle, something's got to happen. When you put that much power in your life, something's got to happen. When the Holy Spirit has given you the power, it's going to be lived out. You will be. It doesn't say, then go and try to be. It, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. It is an emphatic imperative that occurs once we receive the Holy Spirit. And we don't get saved and then receive the Holy Spirit. It happens when we are saved, we receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, the more we die to ourselves and live to Him, the more He takes over our lives. Paul said that one indwelling, Paul evidences that there's one indwelling and multiple infillings. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I leak. And I must be filled with the Holy Spirit. But you say, well, Brother John, that's your interpretation of that passage. No, it's not. 
There's only one accurate interpretation. And so let's go to God's Word and let God's Word interpret God's Word. Go with me to 1 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, the ninth verse. The same Paul under the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit. When I say it's the pleasure seekers in here, holding to a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. He wrote to the church at Corinth, and there was another letter before this that he had written. And then he comes to this letter that's included in the canon of Scripture. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, or the covetous, or the swindlers, or the idolaters, for then you'd have to go out of the world. But actually I wrote you not to associate with any so-called brother if he should be an immoral person, or a covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Go on and read the passage. He's taking it very serious. Now listen, if you say, well, boy, that's good because I know so-and-so, I don't have to eat with them anymore. No, no. This is never done out of hate. It's always done out of love. To ostracize someone, to to identify someone is, is not so that you can be satisfied and get an excuse or so that they can be punished. That is so that they can be what God intends them to be, that they can come to Christ, they can be filled with the Holy Spirit, they can live out in power His intent and purpose and passion for their lives. How many of you ever got a whooping when you were growing home? I'm not talking spanking, I mean a whooping. You got a whooping growing up. Some of you deserved one and didn't raise your hand, but... uh, (laughs) My mama, yeah I'm a southern boy, my mama, My mama never gave me a whooping that I didn't deserve. Matter of fact, there are three or four that she doesn't know about. (laughs) But she never did it out of hate. She always did it out of love. Wanting to correct me, wanting me to know the error of my way, and wanting me to get my life straightened out. The church when we look at one another and we realize our reputation depends. I want you to know it's easier to, to get by holding to a form of godliness and not being the real deal in church. Sometimes we just identify those folks, promote those folks, do so. The world out there, it's harder to be a Rotarian than to be a church member. And our reputation in the community can become so damaged. So avoid the pleasure seeker. But number two, go with me real quickly down to verse 10 in that third chapter. But you, Timothy, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and suffering such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And indeed all, does your copy of God's Word say all? I did a lot of study. Do you know what all means? All. Everybody. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's not what the preacher said to me on TV the other day. He said, God wanted me to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And if I just sent him $1,000, he'd pray for me. Listen, Vern, you send him $1,000, I'll tell you who's going to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. (laughs) All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Well, Brother John, I'm not being persecuted. All who desire to live God in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Little girl in school in America this past week wore her mask, observing social distancing. But on her mask, it happened to mention Jesus. Get out of here! That Budweiser mask is okay. That Satan mask is okay. Jesus ain't coming in my classroom. Get out. 
That's a violation of the Constitution. Listen to me, Vern. Let me tell you what a con the Constitution gave her the right to wear that mask. But even if the Constitution didn't, my God gave her the right to wear that mask. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We're living in a day and time where the church is undergoing persecution. We're in America where I never thought we'd have questions. We're having questions. President Starbucks said, if you believe in traditional marriage, we'd prefer you to not be a customer of Starbucks. I took him at his word. Chick-fil-A, Jesus food. Gets boycotted. Not allowed to have a business in some communities. Why? Because they believe in family. Because they close on Sunday. I found those attacks, those persecutions are going to come from three areas. First of all, there's the satanic attacks that come. Satan, no scratch, he doesn't give a flip about you. He hates God. God loves you. He wants to destroy you so he can take his unholy fist and put it in the face of a holy God and say, I got one of yours. Every once in a while I would have people come to me and say, Brother John, Satan's attacking me. I said, well, tell him to stop. Just kick him in the teeth and tell him to leave you alone. Greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. The Word of God says, draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. Resist Satan and he'll flee from you. Maybe your problem is if you're undergoing satanic attack, maybe you need to get closer to God. Maybe you've got some distance that's made you vulnerable. I've gotten where I kind of like the satanic attacks whenever they come because old Baptist preacher said one time, if you hadn't run into Satan today, you better watch the way you're walking. You must be walking in the same direction. <laughs> the satanic attacks. The second area is in the area of secular attacks. That's where the world's attacking us. That's where the world is attacking who we are and what we do and where we go and how we meet. That's when they can say churches in California have to close, but the bar across the street can stay open. And then when the Supreme Court says you can't close churches because of religious freedom, they say, well, you can meet, but you can't sing. Listen, you let somebody try to tell me how to worship. John, you're safe. The secular attacks, the world's attacks. And you know now, I'm a southern boy, so, you know, they don't understand. They just don't understand. So I just bless their heart. Now, if you're a southerner, you know what that means. It means you don't know dirt. And we southern folks, we can just smile and say, bless your heart. And you say, oh, isn't that sweet? And you didn't even know. They don't understand. Bless their heart. I need to help them understand so they can know Him. But then there's a third area of attack. Persecution that comes. And I call it the, the sacred attacks. And that's not from Satan. It's not from out there. It's in here. It's when we shoot at one another. People, when they're going through some of the toughest, roughest times in their lives, instead of running to the church for comfort and sympathy and understanding and a walk and an arm and embrace, they run from the church because they don't want to be the blunt end of the church's ridicule. During the Persian Gulf War, I learned a term I wasn't familiar with before then. It's called friendly fire. I thought that was an interesting term. 
And suppose that knock came on your door. There was an officer and a chaplain, and they were there to inform you that your son or your daughter had been killed in combat. But they wanted you to know it was friendly fire. Does that make you feel better? Or does that make you feel even worse? That it wasn't the enemy that had shot them. It was one of their own allies that had shot them. Folks, I'll put up with the satanic attacks all day long. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. I'll put up with the secular attacks because bless their heart. But church, it's time we declare an end to secular attacks. We are not the enemy. We need to love one another. We need to embrace one another. Well, it's a pandemic, so... But I see it too often. But then there's a final point. I want you to go with me down to verse 14. How to live in the last days. Avoid the pleasure seekers. Anticipate the persecution. And then finally this morning, abide in the Word of God. Verse 14. You, however, Timothy, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. First of all it was Eunice and Lois, Timothy's mama and grandmama. How many of you are mamas? Would you raise your hand? Now how many of you are grandmamas? Raise your hand. You have responsibilities and opportunities. Wow, isn't that great to to, to say to this young preacher boy, Timothy, you know the sacred writings that you've heard from your childhood, and you know them from whom you've learned them. They had credibility in his life. Folks, we have a responsibility within the family, sharing Christ, sharing God's Word, teaching God's Word, not merely by bringing them to church to hear God's Word and see God's Word and learn God's Word, but at home. Now, it says, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate equipped for every good work. Avoid the pleasure seekers, anticipate the persecution, and abide in the Word of God. Folks, do you understand this is a miracle right here in my hand? And the fact that we get to hear God's Word, read God's Word, follow God's Word, and know God's Word, what an awesome opportunity. What a major responsibility. Well, how do we abide in the Word of God? Three things, real quickly. You listen real quick right now. First of all, you've got to hear God's Word. That's one reason why it's very important. Your search team, if I know their hearts, and nobody knows our hearts except God alone. This is deceitful in every way, but they're looking for the man of God that's God's man who will share God's Word with God's people on a consistent basis. You want to hear the Word of God. We've got to hear God's Word. We've got to hear it from the pulpit. We've got to hear it at home. We've got to hear it as we read God's Word. We've got to hear God's Word. God's promised to bless His Word, not my words, not your words, not anybody's words, but God's Word carries with it a promise. His Word will not return void. God's Word is desperately needed. This is God's inerrant, infallible Word, and everything in God's Word is true and God's plan and purpose for our lives. So you've got to hear God's Word. I used to have people tell me they'd be at a crusade or they'd be at a conference and so they come up, you know, Brother John, I believe what you say. I believe what, what you do. My preacher doesn't believe that. My, where I go to church, they don't teach that. They don't believe that all of God's Word, they, they reinterpret God's Word. I used to say, well, honey, you just stay there. You pray for your pastor. You lift him up before God and let God deal with him. And you just, now I say, get out of church. Find a church where the Bible is preached 
where God's man stands and unapologetically will share God's word. Listen, gang, we don't have enough time to play games anymore. We're in the last two minutes of the ball game. If you're not, and by the way, if you're sitting in this room, you're in a church that believes God's Word. I don't think you're going to put up with having a pastor who doesn't believe God's Word. And I don't think your search team will bring you a pastor that doesn't believe God's Word. So, if you're somewhere else, you need to be here. Hmm? Hear God's Word. Number two is, you got to heed God's Word. The Word itself says to be doers of the Word, not hearers only. You've got to heed God's Word. You've got to obey the Word of God. Not just say, boy, that was great. I love that. I love reading the Word of God. Boy, I've got one on my coffee table somewhere if I can find it. But it's, you know, you go to somebody's home and they pull out the Bible that's got dust all over it. You've got to not only hear God's Word, you've got to not only read God's Word, you've got to heed God's Word. You've got to do what God says do. And then finally, and God just really had to work on me with this one. And I share it with you because God shared it with me. It really, he, he really worked on me to do this. You've got to hear God's Word and heed God's Word, but you have to habituate God's Word. It has to become a habit. If you've been in God's Word and God's Word's become a part of your life, it becomes just a natural outflow for you to do what God's Word says do. And you develop that habit. You see, if, if the reason God had to work on me with it is if my wife were to, I, if I left and didn't kiss her goodbye, she'd say, you forgot to kiss me. I guess I'm just out of the habit, honey. Well, when I got up off the floor, I'm sure that my <laughs> habit would change. But see, it's not, it didn't, it's not just a habit, but it is a habit. You know, I think I shared with y'all, she read an article a few months ago that said guys that uh, kiss their wives every morning live 25% longer than husbands that don't and make 40% more income. She started puckering up twice every morning. <laughs> I would visit somebody who had been out for four or five weeks and we've been missing you at church. Where you been? Oh, preacher, I guess I just got out of the habit. <laughs> but then I realized you know what? I tithe. It's a habit. I don't say, well, now, am I going to tithe this week or not tithe this week? You know, coming to church. Well, it's Sunday. Am I going to go to church today, honey, or not? Some of you say, well, you're the preacher. Y'all heard about the guy that told his mama, he said, he was still in bed on Sunday morning. His mama said, son, get up. You've got to go to church. He said, I'm not going down there. I don't like those people. They don't like me. They're always talking about me. They put me down. Some of them have even asked me not to come back. And I'm not going down there. She said, honey, you're going. There's three reasons you're going. First of all, I'm your mama, and I said you're going. You're going to church. Second, the Bible says to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and you're going to obey the Bible. And third, you're the pastor of that church, and they expect to see you when you get down there. <laughs> Habituate the Word of God. How many of you pray before your meals? We do. We don't ask, okay, we're fixing to eat, whether it's at home or whether it's at. We even pray at McDonald's. I'm not sure it's grace. I think it's protection. <laughs> and if you work at McDonald's, I was just joking. Save those emails. But uh, it's a habit. But it's a biblical habit. 
In this day and time, you and I must avoid the pleasure seekers. Anticipate the persecution because it's here. And abide in the word of God so we can live the life God intends us to live until Jesus comes and takes us home. Will you bow your heads with me right now? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Can I be so bold as to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready? Were he to rapture his church, come for his bride? Are you ready? You say, Brother John, you're trying to scare us. No, I'm not. I'm trying to prepare you. Would you come? In just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing, and I'm going to pray just before we sing. Pastors are going to be here at the front. If you're not certain that were he to return, two are in the field, one's taken, one's left. If you are sure, not sure that you'd be taken, that you, and you're wondering whether you'd be left, don't leave here with it unsettled. You can settle it this morning. You can settle it right now. Some of us, we've got friends and family that we know aren't ready. Some of us may even know that some of our family are holding to a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And this morning, you want to use this altar as a place of prayer. You want to bring them before the Lord, or perhaps you've got something you just need to, between you and the Lord, you just need to leave it and make this an altar of prayer, an altar of commitment, and say, Lord, I want that new beginning. I want to leave it behind. I want to get some stuff done. I want to get some stuff settled. I want to get some stuff out of my life. Some of us have gotten out of the habit. We've let loose lifestyle kind of creep into our lives during a pandemic when we've been kind of shut out and shut in and we're ready to get back. We're ready to get it back together. We may even just want to make that commitment. You have total liberty in these next few moments. If you're at home or you're somewhere where you're watching this on stream, there's a text number that's appearing across the bottom of the screen. You can text SAVE to that number. You'll get an immediate response. And someone will follow up with you to help you, to pray for you, and to walk with you. Whatever way God speaks, you be obedient. Father God, you know us. You know us uniquely. And Lord, we don't know your time schedule. We don't know the when, but we know that there will be a what, that you will come that Jesus will return and we want to be ready. We want to be found faithfully in the fields working. We want to be doing what you've called us to do and be what you call us to be. And Father, I pray in these moments that whatever it is we need to do to be ready, to be right, we pray that that will be what happens in these next moments. Father, do what only you can do, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me right now all over the room. You have total liberty. Won't you come?